Journey IFC strives to create safe spaces to worship God. Know that you are welcome just as you are, regardless of religious background or lack thereof, skin color, political affiliation, sexuality, age, culture, or any other label you own or society throws on you. You are welcomed and celebrated here just as you are. Hey y'all, my name is Jacob. Hey. Hey. I always make that face after I'm like, yes. <laughs> I know it's coming. Um, so we're going to continue this series that we're calling Enough for Today, Today. Um, so we've done this mantra, and so you may have remembered we did, I am enough, I have enough, today is I do enough. But I was curious, does anyone remember how the mantra goes with the hands on the hands? I remember one. Hey, yeah, more than enough is enough. Okay, so we'll say, I am enough. I have enough. I do enough. That's today. Enough is enough. That was so fun. And then you just take a deep breath in. Enough. So let's do that all together. And maybe close your eyes as you do it this time. So we'll say, I am enough. I have enough. I do enough. Enough is enough. Enough. Let us pray. God, today as we talk about doing enough, I pray that we can set aside all of the stuff that we were doing before we got here. Maybe that long list of things that is never ending, that we keep meaning to get done. Help us to calm our hearts, our minds, our spirits, and to be available to what you are doing right now in this space. Help us to be available to one another, Help us to be open to, to learning something, to experiencing something um, that, can, that can make today feel enough. God, in all that we do, in the stress or in the anxiety or even in the nothingness when we sit and we can't do anything, help us remember that we are enough, that we have enough, and that we do enough. Help us to feel enough today. This is my prayer. Hi, I'm Ace. Hi, Ace. The reading comes, or our reading comes from one of Jesus' teachings called the Parable of the Sower, found in Matthew 13. That same day, Jesus went out of the house and sat beside the sea. Such great crowds gathered around him that he got into a boat and sat there while the whole crowd stood on the beach. And he told them many things in parables, saying, Listen, the sower went out to sow, and as he sowed, some seeds fell on the path, and the birds came and ate them up. Other seeds fell on rocky ground, where they did not have much soil, and they sprang up quickly, since they had no depth of soil. But when the sun rose, they were scorched, and since they had no root, they withered away. Other seeds fell among thorns, and the thorns grew up and choked them. Other seeds fell on good soil and brought forth grain, some a hundredfold, some sixty, some thirty. If you have ears, hear. Hear then the parable of the sower. When anyone hears the word of the kingdom and does not understand it, the evil one comes and snatches away what is sown in the heart. This is what was sown on the path. As for what was sown on rocky ground, this is the one who hears the word and immediately receives it with joy. Such a person has no root, but endures only for a while and when trouble or persecution arises on account of the word, that person immediately falls away. As for what was sown among the thorns, this is the one who hears the word, but the cares of this age and the lures of wealth choke the word, and it hears nothing. But as for what was sown on good soil, this is the one who hears the word and understands it, who indeed bears fruit and yields in one case a hundredfold, in another sixty, and in another thirty. Um, when I think about doing enough, I think about a particular song, and it's one that I know Mary really loves as well. Um, but it's called the Servant Song. I think about um, when we're doing in the world, this is how I want to show up. And so I invite you to sing along. <laughs>
So for the past two weeks, we have done this kind of radical thing of believing in this mantra that we created. This mantra that has told us that we are enough and that we have enough. And today we are going to explore how we also do enough. And I would say this is a fairly countercultural mantra of ours. Because so much of our world is telling us that we are in fact not enough, right? That we need more and more and that we need to do our part and step up to the plate. And we get this from probably social media, commercials. I saw a commercial where it was like, have you done the tissue test with your teeth? And it's putting a, a bleached <laughs> tissue next to your teeth, thinking that humans are meant to be like, it just blows my mind. So from social media, commercials, maybe it's from toxic friends or family members. And historically, it's come a lot from the Christian religion that we just aren't enough. In various scriptures, we are told that we must not just be hearers of the word, but we also need to be doers and going out and doing more. We need to bring the kingdom of God here. and We are the hands and feet of Christ, so if we don't do anything, God's not doing anything. We also must go out and make you know, disciples of all nations. So many messages telling us to go and do more than we already are doing right now. Now we live in a society where we can get so much done, right? At our fingertips, we have access to more information than any other generation before us. Just ask Siri or Alexa for anything, and it seems that you can get it. And although we have become so efficient with information gathering and business management and all that stuff, people seem to be working longer and longer hours. Despite research showing that more work does not lead to better business outcomes and certainly not healthier employees. People are rewarded for making their 40 hour work week look more like 60 or 80 hours. And you can make a lot of money doing it this way and, and collect a great treasure of wealth, but at what cost? I don't know about all of y'all, but our culture's high rate of productivity exhausts me. Mm. I feel like I'm playing catch up always. But I still find myself week after week kicking myself because I'm thinking, man, I should have done more. I didn't get enough done. I'm not enough. And this week was actually the week of this series that I find the most difficult for myself to believe at times. This is the piece of the mantra that I think a lot of journeyers are struggling with as well, believing that we are doing enough. Many of us feel like we could do more. So how do we get to a place where we can believe that what we do is enough? In seminary, I was um, introduced to disability theory. Are you, is anyone familiar with disability theory? Okay, well, disability theory is a framework of analyzing the world in a way that centers the experiences of differently abled people, but also challenging ableist assumptions that shape our society. Disability theorists and even disability theologians have given voice to many who often feel overlooked or belittled by the world. And a helpful tool I learned from this disability theory as an able-bodied individual myself um, that reminds me that my experience is not everyone else's experience is this tool called spoon theory. You heard that right, spoon theory. So spoon theory was coined by a woman named Christine, I'm gonna get her name wrong, Miserandino who is a writer that lives with a chronic illness. Since so many people around her struggle to understand her experience with disability, she came up with this way, actually over one conversation, to tell her friends what it is like to go through the world as an individual with a chronic illness. And she did this with the imagery of spoons. Why spoons, may I ask? Well, because when Christine's friend asked her what it was like, the thing in front of her was a bunch of spoons on a table, and so she grabbed them and said, this will work. So what we're going to do is just visualize spoon theory in this way. Imagine at the start of the day, you were given a set amount of spoons. Don't question it, just go over it. Each spoon represents a unit of energy that you must spend to complete a task. And to complete said task, you must give up one of your spoons for the day, knowing that you will not get more spoons back until the following day. Christine described to her friend that it's a privilege to not have to make choices in your day. For a so-called healthy or able-bodied individual, one can go throughout the day getting things done and not having to consider or consciously think about spending any of their energy. But for people with chronic illnesses and disabilities, they are having to navigate the world in a way that preserves just enough energy to make it to the end of the day. 
So Christine asked her friend to take the 12 spoons on the table. That's a lot of spoons for one table, but there was 12 spoons on the table, and she took them into her hands. And then she told her friend to describe step by step to the smallest detail everything she did on a day-to-day -day basis, just like the daily tasks. So she began listing you know, the chores and routines that came to mind, and Christine stopped her and said, no, 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 first you got out of bed, right? But I'm sorry, you realize that you were already running late. You didn't sleep well last night. But now you have to get up and make some food because you cannot take your medicine on an empty stomach. And if you don't take your medicine, you might as well have no spoons today or tomorrow, so you're going to have to do the work. Therefore, it has already cost you one spoon just to get out of bed. Christine's friend began to realize how frustrating this was going to be because she started describing her shower and her normal routine of washing her hair and shaving, and guess what? That cost her another spoon. Lifting your hands up that long just isn't going to work. And then she started planning her outfit for the day to accommodate for the weather and the temperature of the office and her physical comfort or discomfort, and guess what? That was another spoon. And the morning routine kept going in this spoon practice, and Christine's friend had listed more and more details and soon was only left with six spoons, and she still hadn't left the house for work. So they continued the day and learned that if you skip lunch, that would cost you a spoon. And so did standing on the train, because it's just a lot of work for your body, as well as sitting at your computer too long and typing. Those are also spoons. By the time this theoretical dinner of that day came around, Christine's friend only had one single spoon left. She didn't have enough spoons to make dinner or to do any chores around the house or even have some fun for herself. For Christine said, it's always important to keep one spoon available in case of emergency. Christine's friend finally got it and burst into tears. Understanding how different life could be if you always have to make these conscious choices to use your energy, especially when that energy is limited in your day. I know it's a strange way to describe it, but I believe it's a super, super helpful visualization to understand how differently able people have to approach a day. And I think it can give some insights for us, even if we are disabled, if we have a chronic illness or not. What may take one of us one or even no spoons may take another one of us three spoons. Therefore, comparing what we do to what others are doing isn't really a fair comparison, right? And this spoon theory was started from that one conversation and soon became common language throughout the community of chronically ill and disabled people. It's even used as a way to check in on friends who are experiencing this, right? How many spoons you got? You know, it's something we could even say here at Journey. How many spoons you got? And then, and then in this case, you can say, well, I actually have some extra spoons today. Maybe I can come and support you and give you one of my spoons. Spoon theory can help us slow down and realize the limitations of our bodies, our minds, and our spirits. Sometimes we are having a hard day and simply cannot do any more, for our spoons are running too low. Brittany Brown, who I have heard called one of the patron saints of Journey, um, is a research professor at the University of Houston, um, and she describes in her book The Atlas of the Heart, a practice that her and her husband use in their home that's kind of similar to this. So instead of spoons, they use percentages. And these percentages, they combine, because they're a couple, her and her husband come together, and they combine their percentages at the end of the day. And so they get to the end of the day, and they realize that there's more left to do, and so they sit down and they share what percentage they're at, what they have left in their tank, right? So if Brene was like, I'm white today, I've just been really busy, I'm only at 20%, what do you got? And her husband says, well, I'm doing a little better, but I'm still, not doing great. I'm about at 60%. Well, they add that up and that gets to 80%, which means they're not running at full capacity, which is 100. So if they don't hit 100%, they have to figure out how to make things or take things off of their plate so that they do not spread themselves too thin. Knowing that some days you will have more, some days your partner will have more, those in your community will have more, and some days you won't. But if you get to the end of the day and you do not hit 100%, Say you get to 80% like that last example, you have to then take off 20% of the remaining workload of the day. This may include saying to your kids, hey, are y'all cool not going to practice today? We just don't have it in us and we could just use a break and I think you could use a break too. Or saying, you know what, 
we have some money. Let's just pay someone to come clean for us another day and don't worry about the laundry. We have some clothes, we'll be fine. Or you can say, you know what? We're ordering in tonight. That's what we're doing. It takes negotiating to figure out how to accommodate for what you have left at the end of the day. Both spoon theory and this percentage practice of Brene Brown remind us that we are humans with human bodies and therefore limitations on what we can and cannot get done in a day. Some of us are privileged enough to have some extra spoons handy or have quite a full tank, but others around us are not. And this is built into human nature. We cannot do it all, even if the world or our jobs or even if our religion tells us to do more. I actually like to joke that even Jesus, who seemed to work himself to the bone, only had a ministry career that lasted three years, right? And get this, he was killed at the end of that three years, so I don't think this is a sustainable model for any of us to live. We can't be working this hard always. And so I want to turn to a piece of scripture, a parable in fact, to help us see the value of being intentional with the work that we do in a day. A text that reminds me that we are doing enough. One that's often not interpreted in this way, and we're going to get a little playful with that. So in the parable of the sower, we're told of a person who goes out and throws out some seed all over the place. And some seed fell on a path, and those seeds were eaten up by some birds that came down and saw them there because they didn't have any soil. Other seed fell on a rocky soil and soon sprouted up, but quickly died away, didn't have enough roots, and the soil was too shallow for more growth, and the sun simply was too hot. Other seed fell among the thorns, and while they grew some, they were eventually choked out by all the thorns surrounding them. And finally, some seed fell among good soil, and it brought forth, it says, a hundredfold, and some sixty, and some thirty, which are impressive numbers there. I didn't know this, but in agricultural terms, a return of 30% on a crop is almost unheard of in the natural world. And this is like, if we're talking about a savings account, that was at 30% interest, that would be wild, right? That's unbelievably prosperous. This is super power soil if it's giving a hundredfold, right? So what does this parable teach us? Unlike some other parables, we're actually given a description of what Jesus was trying to get across with this parable. It's built into the text, so we heard that description. We are told that the soil is us, and that the seed is the word of God, or however you want to interpret that being thrown all around willy-nilly, hoping to spring up in us and produce these large quantities. We become the product in this story, expecting to do more and produce more for God, right? Meaning if we do not produce, then I guess we are the problem. That isn't really realistic, right? We can't be expected to live at a rate where all we do and everything that we put into the world produces a hundredfold or even thirtyfold for that matter. So I want to suggest another interpretation, interpretation of this parable. What if instead of looking at the soil as a problem, what if we look at the sower? In fact, this parable is called the parable of the sower, which means we should be focusing our attention not on the soil, but on the sower, right? It's not a parable of the seed or the soil. So let us examine the sower a bit. They seem to be working very hard. They have thrown seed all over the place, even place it doesn't belong. They've thrown seed on good soil, bad soil, not typical of a farmer, right? Seeds are valuable, and one would not just throw them away. They would go about putting them carefully where they need to be, planting each seed in the right environment for that fruit or vegetable or whatever it may be to grow. But the sower did not do that. It seems the sower has spread them, their seed too carelessly and maybe a bit too thin. A lot of the work has been done, but without intention. Therefore, much of that work will produce very little, some being eaten up by the birds, other being burned away by the sun. So what if the issue is not the soil or the seed, but the one who placed it? And what if this, seed, this means that the work we do, while important, will sometimes land in a great place that produces a lot? And sometimes our work isn't meant to grow. Maybe our work is just meant to feed the birds. I just think this parable is an interesting way to look at the work we do in the world. 
It seems that we are not meant to spread ourselves thin and get everything done, especially if that means risking the seed to unhealthy soils not suitable for growth. While this parable has so often been used to critique us for not doing enough and taking God's word and producing more and more, it makes me wonder what if we have gotten it all backwards and blamed the soil for what the sower has done. Back to spoon theory, what if the seed was placed in a plot that had nothing left to give? For life had been hard and rocky for that soil. The soil's spoons were all used up. That's a weird line to say. Let me say it again. The soil spoons were all used up. It's easier to have grace for that soil when we think about it this way. Instead of complaining about the rocky nature of the soil, what if those other plots were where sustainable soil was at? What if those areas and those people helped clear away some of the stones that prevented growth in that rocky field? This parable then turns into an example of using our work to go cultivate healthier and more sustainable growth for not only ourselves, but for those around us who may be struggling. Maybe we won't all produce a lot. Maybe we weren't designed for that level of production. Maybe we need to share the burden and therefore also the fruits of our labor, noting that everyone is doing the best they can with what they have. Let's have some grace for the sower too. What if they spread the seed so thin and carelessly because they had nothing left to give either? What if the sower, the seed, and the soil had all spent all of their spoons and just needed to be done for the day. And what if they had done enough? And even if that didn't produce large quantities, what if that was enough? You may have heard the phrase from Benjamin Franklin, don't put off till tomorrow what you can do today. But I like this reframe. Aaron Burr takes on this quote. Burr says, never do today what you can put off till tomorrow. <laughs> My kind of guy is a procrastinator here. But he continues to say, delay may give clearer light as to what is best to be done. I want to say that again. Never do today what you can put off till tomorrow. Delay may give clearer light as to what is best to be done. It is okay to be spent. It is okay to not get much done in a day. We are not robots. We are not meant to go, go, go and produce these large quantities. No, we are humans only capable of so much. Only granted a limited amount of spoons in a day. And maybe putting off some doing today will allow us to make better decisions with our spoons tomorrow. So don't beat yourself up if you feel like really terrible soil or a careless sower with no spoons. Instead, just care for yourself and tend your soil. And growth will come when it's time and when you are ready. But till then, you are doing enough. And that is all that can be asked of any of us. We are enough. We have enough. And journeyers, we do enough. May it be so. Amen. Well, God, we lift to you these prayers. Um, and it's easier to lift them when we have all these hands around us to help. So thank you for giving us this community. Amen. 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 So we have one more song. I kind of want to stay up here and sing together. Is that okay? We can do that. I, don't, I think we've sang this song before, but I want to teach you all it. It's called Hold Us Together. Yeah, if you need to sit, feel free. Um, and it's uh, about how the only thing that'll hold us together is love. Um, and if we, no matter what we do, that if we're loving, like that is, that's the important thing. So, let's learn it. It don't have a job.
this. Whenever you're in doubt of something like that, remember who put you here. A perfect God, our creator, who does not make mistakes. So how can you ever think that you are not enough, that you don't have enough, and that you don't do enough? But sometimes enough is enough, and we need to see through that. Remember this, a gallon bucket is doing the best it can when it holds a gallon. <laughs> Go in peace. Amen. Amen. Amen.